Okay, today we start with my boy, T.D. Jakes, before you do. Making great decisions that you won't regret. Random page, here we go. Are cumbersome and often lead to bouts of depression and lifetime battle with low self-esteem. I am glad to say that such mistakes are not terminal and regret doesn't signal the end of the world. Many people have, in spite of such adversities, become productive contributors to society and have made countless strides for the betterment of all. However, more times than not, such difficulties require the whole family working to tip the scales and give the innocent child a better chance of success. I confess I have had this situation in my own family and will discuss that later in more detail. But I earnestly warn you that the stats on prisons, suicides, and drug abuse show that the numbers go up when morals break down and the child comes from a single parent home. For the sake of all, the grandparents who are fixed on fixed incomes and walkers and who are trying to keep up with grandbabies on big wheels. For the sake of grandmothers who are trying to find a ride to the school for a conference instead of tending to the garden in their backyards. Let's stop the madness. One wrong decision can sentence your whole family to a lifetime of homework and heartbreak. It could all be avoided by just waiting a little while longer to do things right. If you are not ready to lead another life for the next 30 years or slow, so, slow down. Babies who have babies lose a lot of important experiences and often are faced with too much too fast syndromes that leave our communities on life support and our marriages on respirators. We all have regrets. It's a part of life's learning process. But as we get older and progress through life, hopefully we learn to stop and recognize situations that feel familiar, where if we go on, we might regret our actions or something we've said. One page of everything I need to know I learned from a children's book. Rando, rando, here we go. And boom, bada bing. It's short, so we're going to read two pages. Babar, the young king of the elephants, and his wife, Queen Celeste, have just left for their wedding trip in a balloon. Goodbye, see you soon, cry the elephants, as they watch the balloon rise and drift away. Arthur, Babar's little cousin, still waves his beret. Old Cornelius, who is a chief over all the elephants when the king is away, anxiously sighs. I do hope they won't have any accidents. The country of the elephants is now far away. The balloon glides noiselessly into the sky. Babar and Celeste admire the landscape below. What a beautiful journey. The air is balmy. The wind is gentle. There is the ocean, the big blue ocean. Blown out over the sea by the wind, the balloon is suddenly caught by a violent storm. Babar and Celeste tremble with fear and cling with all their might to the basket of the balloon. But extraordinary good fortune, just as the balloon is about to fall into the sea, a final puff of wind blows it on an island where it flattens out and collapses. You aren't hurt, Celeste, are you? Babar inquires anxiously. No. Well then look, we are saved. Okay. <clears throat> Leslie Moons, The Virtue of Curiosity. I have fond memories of my childhood and the books that encountered then. I was read to when I was very young. Then I went through a phase from about six to nine when I read sports books and sports biographies. But as a young child around four, the Babar books by Jean de Brunhoff were my absolute favorites. My mother, an avid reader until this day, found them for me. To show how naive I was, I didn't realize until many years later that they were French in origin. For me, these books provided noticeable life lessons. Babar, the elephant, is quite sensitive and quite exploratory. He is very interested in everything in the world. Babar goes to new places, Paris, the seashore, mountains, and travels in a balloon and on an ocean liner. I related to him because I wanted to be an, an adventurer. I was very curious. To this day, I remain curious. It helps me every day that I am in my job and that I am on earth. 
Because I am dealing with a world that is so rapidly changing in the media environment, it is important to value curiosity. I just spent a day up in Silicon Valley, meeting with people who are 20 years old and forming new companies. It is really fascinating and exciting to see what they are doing. Curiosity is required every day in my work, more now than ever. I just learned to value that virtue as a child in the books about Babar. And one page from starting and running a small business. Okay, getting your application through the system. The process of registering your mark begins with preparing and filing your application. According to CIPO, a complete trademark application consists of the following. The applicant's name and mailing address, a representation of the trademark, a description of the trademark or both, a statement in specific and ordinary commercial terms of the goods and services associated with the trademark, the statement of goods and services grouped according to the NICE classification discussed earlier, the application fee at the time of writing is $330 for the class of goods or services that the trademark relates to and $100 for each additional class. Any other requirements specific to the trademark that the applicant wants to register? You can log into the trademark e-filing system here. If you don't have an account, you can... After you finish filing your application online, you may think you're home free. Think again. The journey of your application through the CIPO has just started. If your application has met all the filing requirements and you've paid the fee, a filing date and an application number will be assigned. You'll receive acknowledgement and a proof sheet to review within seven business days of receipt of the application. Then, according to the CIPO, here's a rundown of the, here's a rundown of they do next. They searched the trademark database to find any registered or pending trademark that may be confused with your trademark. Don't worry, the CIPO will tell you if they find anything concerning. Two, they examine your application to make sure it doesn't contravene the trademark's act and regulations. At this point, they can raise your objections to your trademark registration, and they will let you know if any pieces of your application are outstanding. Since we're only at eight minutes, we are going to read a page from Minerals, Rocks, and Gems. Bada boom, bada bing. Var varicite. Varicite seldom forms white to colorless crystals. Rather, they are mostly radial spherical aggregates with crusty coatings and whitish to green coarse dense masses. The latter type are used for jewelry purpose. Hardness 4 to 5. Density 2.52. Luster virtuous to waxy. Cleavage none. Fracture conchoidal. Tenacity brittle. Similar minerals. Strangite is virtually never green. Wave light has a different crystal form. or thorhombic crystal form. Okay, strangite. Strangite forms blue, purple, to pink, purple, tabular to isometric crystals that are often rich in faces, as well as radial and spherical aggregates, crusts, and coatings. It occurs together with such, with other secondary phosphate minerals such as cacoxinite or phosphorosideite. Occurrences in phosphorus containing brown iron deposits and phosphate pegmatites, where it is formed through the weathering of other phosphate minerals. Similar minerals Phosphos Phosphosiderite has a different crystal form, but is not easily distinguishable from strangite in radial aggregates. Amethyst, which is very similar in color, is much harder. Its hardness, strangite, is 
3 to 4, density 2.87, luster vitreous, cleavage perfect basal, fracture conchoidal, tenacity brittle. Okay, that brings us to 10 minutes. Thank you for tuning in.